Monarch, Legacy of Monsters, an Apple original series. The world is on fire. I decided to do something about it. On November 17th. This place, it's not ours. Believe me. The most massive event of the year arrives. But if you come with me, you'll know everything, I promise. Oh my God, go, go, go! Monarch, Legacy of Monsters. Streaming November 17th, only on Apple TV+. Plus. This episode is brought to you by Reese's Peanut Butter Cups. Some things are just better together. Like party playlists and Friday nights. Campfires and ghost stories. Peanut butter and chocolate. And Reese's Cups are the perfect combination of creamy peanut butter and delicious milk chocolate. So, when you want something sweet, you can't do better than Reese's Peanut Butter Cups. Buy Reese's today wherever candy is sold. Hey, I'm Jamie Glowacki, and you are listening to Oh Crap, I Love My Toddler, But Holy Fuck. This is a podcast for conscious parents who drop the F-bomb a lot. Hey, welcome, welcome. Today, I want to talk about expectations. I want to talk about parental expectations that are both too high and also too low. So that's a huge force behind my new book, right? Oh, crap, I have a toddler, is that we have these out of whack expectations. It happens a lot in my work and it has happened in my potty training work for years and years and it's ramping up with my parenting work. And in the last two years, it's super ramped up this, this out of whack expectation. Like sometimes I'll be on the phone with a client. I'm like, what? Like you really are expecting that from your child? And I'm not, you know, I'm not trying to mock anybody. I just am shocked that parents have both simultaneous expectations that are way too high and way too low. And I think what has happened is this is really perpetrated through social media. If you guys, you know, know my work at all, you know, I'm obsessed with like, how did we get here? Like, how did potty training get to be so crazy? How did the the new age range for potty training become like three or four when just a generation ago was 18 months to 24 months? And so I always like to look back and I like to sort of be a social archaeologist, if you will, and see where things went wrong or where things sort of changed. And social media has definitely changed things. And I know we know this in the sense of like, you know, people are presenting their best on social media and we have this sort of skewed vision of other people's lives. But in the last two years, another thing has happened that I think has really skewed our perception. And that is sponsored and paid ads on Facebook. Now, I I sponsor and pay for my ads on Facebook. So I'm I'm in this group. But what I see so much is that, you know, there's so many programs out there. And by the way, this is what happened with potty training and the three-day potty training myth is if you Google potty training, there is a huge amount of potty train your kid in three days. This has literally skewed our perception to think that potty training absolutely should take three days for every child. And if it doesn't take three days, your child's not ready or you're screwing it up. And this myth, oh my God, it's the myth I work the hardest to, against that and like wait till they're ready. But it's a, it's a learning curve, you guys. It's a milestone. Like what other milestone does your kid do in exactly the same amount of time as, as another kid? And so what has happened is just the proliferation of these programs and the advertisements has skewed our perception. And there is a skewed perception about parenting in general. There's other parenting coaches and parenting programs, and I see them on my Facebook feed and my Instagram feed all the time. But one of the things that happens is we start to think that because there's a program out there that says, stop yelling forever, end all your power struggles, we end up thinking that, holy shit, I shouldn't ever have a power struggle with my kid. I should never yell at my kid. Of course, we don't want to yell at our kids, but everybody loses their shit with their kids, right? So in our last episode, I talked about a a mama in my coaching circle who was under the impression that power struggles should never happen because she follows a more gentle discipline, a, you know, I call it hippy dippy. And I put myself in this group, this sort of hippy dippy parenting philosophy that she should never have power struggles. And that is because these programs and these ads are skewing our perception. And that is one of the reasons that we have these out of whack expectations. 
So I want to run through this episode's going to be a little interesting in this way is that I want to run through a lot of these expectations and they're sort of willy nilly. There's no rhyme or reason. And I'm just going to kind of hop through them and see if you recognize yourself in them and see how we can shift and change them. So I was just working with a family and very, very, um, a, just a, a ramped up little boy who is, you know, showing some sort of wackadoodle behavior all day long. And it was very poignant because the mom said, you know, all I want at the end of the day is I want a kid who will listen to what I say the first time. And I just, I almost like my coffee almost came out of my nose because I almost burst out laughing so hard. I was like, oh, mama, that expectation is way too high. You're not going to have a kid who listens the first time. No kid listens the first time. Like my kid's awesome. And, you know, he's 13 now and he does not listen the first time. Kids have to be told things multiple times very often. So that right there, there's an expectation that is too high. If you're expecting your child to just be compliant and listen to you the first time, it's not going to happen. Oh, you know what? It can happen, but you're going to have to be an authoritarian, maybe incorporate corporal punishment. Like you're going to have to be the strictest, meanest mom you know, do you want to live in fear? Do you want your child to fear you at all times? Then maybe it's possible, but that's not how, you know, you can stop listening to my podcast because that's not how I operate. But that is an expectation that is way too high. Another expectation is that a child can stop a tantrum on their own. The very best you can do with a tantrum is maybe realize, like get to know your kid's particular ramp up, what it looks like. And if you can catch them in the, you know, let's say a tantrum zero to 60, if you can catch them in the zero to 10 and distract them, then you have a chance at at that tantrum not fully manifesting. But once your child is mid tantrum, Dude, you cannot, you got to ride out the storm, just like batten down the hatches and ride out the storm. A child cannot stop a tantrum. They're just on this track that they cannot jump themselves. It's an emotional buildup. It's an emotional track that they can't step out of. The other thing is parents think that they can somehow talk their child out of a tantrum. You need to just shut up. When your kid is mid tantrum, sit down on the floor, get against the wall, make sure you're safe, make sure your child's safe, but you've just literally got to wait it out. There is no way to stop a tantrum mid tantrum. A very, very funny expectation I hear consistently in potty training and parenting is that your child, your toddler is going to listen to logic. Oh, they are so far away from logic. I had one parent tell me that they were trying to read the nutritional labels to their three and a half year old little girl in hopes that she would recognize the sugar content that she wanted to eat. And I was like, oh, no, that's not going to (laughs) work. Toddlers are so far away from logic. Logic, ah, gosh, logic is not even going to start to come into the picture till maybe six or seven. And even then, it's just a tiny bit. Remember, your child's limbic system, their executive functioning, all of these things are like nowhere near being completely formed. So the idea that logic's going to work is is not going to happen. Yeah, so, so stop attempting logic. Another huge expectation is that your child is going to sit and do something resembling schoolwork or penmanship or academics. This is a big, big thing happening right now that, you know, that your two or three year old should be able to form letters or spell their name and it's not going to happen. They don't have the focus. I go back to this, like, let's be in their shoes for just a little while. Like, imagine you are only two or three years on the planet and like you've just mastered all this cool stuff, eating and running. And and now you want to climb and you want to take yourself to the limit of your body, of your mind, of these emotions that you're having. Right. And so, that we, we can't expect a kid to just sit and, and comply and focus for long periods of time. It's, it's too explosive, the growth, the brain development, yeah? On that note, there's this collective expectation that our little ones can manage their own emotions, which they just can't. A lot of times they don't even have the words for all the emotions that are happening. I am a huge fan. I don't even have a favorite. You can just Google emotion charts and they're, they're wonderful. There's usually about, mm, I don't, about 20 faces. Usually they look almost like emojis and they show all the various 
emotions with a face to it. So, you know, we tend to run the gamut with happy or sad and that's it or angry. And there's so many more emotions. And so that's one of the best things you can do to, to start instilling emotional wisdom, right? Is, is naming these emotions and, and putting labels to them. So your child starts to understand them, right? They cannot manage their own emotions. And on that note, we have to talk about shame because there's this expectation that our children can handle shame and they can't. So a lot of the freakouts, a lot of the meltdowns you're seeing is your child has been bathed in shame and they are freaking out. Shame is one of the yuckiest, yuckiest feelings. And I think we do, you know, we did talk about that in the last episode with timeouts. When you embarrass your child, when you shame your child, That feeling is a primal yuck and your child will rebel against feeling that feeling. We all do. That's why people lie, right? They feel shame. They feel shame about something about themselves. And so they lie. They make up a story about themselves or about the situation. They don't want to get busted. So shame is huge and our children can't handle it. So really be aware of that. You know, some of the bigger offenders are when we publicly reprimand our kid when we yell at them in public, when we other people can hear what's happening. That's why in the last episode, we talked about uh, whispering, right? Whispering right into your child's ear and you will eliminate. It's not only fixing the behavior you're seeing in the moment, but that behavior gets exacerbated because the child gets bathed in shame and they freak out. Yeah. And they cannot handle that feeling on their own. So that's something you might want to process later after your child's calmed down. We also have this um, this vibe, this collective expectation that our kids give a rat's ass about what we think, right? And they don't. They really don't. It's not their job right now. Uh, right when they're like, you know, one, 18 months, two, they do. They're invested in what we think. But remember, that's prior to individuation. So they do have an investment. They think we're one and the same person, right? That's why I, that's why I'm such a fan of potty training at that age, because they care what you think. Once, you know, two and a half, three years old hits, your child starts that psychological process of individuation where they pull against you. Again, same thing that a teenager does on a different level, right? Which is where we get the three-nager term. So your child, their entire job is to figure out who they are separate from you. So really, they don't care what you think. So stop expecting them. That's We have this... Um, You know, within the gentle parenting community, there's this idea that we should be our children's friend. We are still the parent. Yeah. And so we still have to carve the path. We still have to be the adult in the room who knows better, who knows more. You know, I always go back to like wolves. If you ever watch wolves, you know, pick up a documentary or something. Oh, my God. Mama wolves will just bite, you know, and this is I'm sure in all the animal kingdom, they'll bite their their babies if they're in danger, if they're putting themselves in danger. Right. And so. I feel like that's a really great model for us to look at is that not that we want to bite our kids or or put our hands on them, but what we do need to do is we're not their friends. We're not, they're too young. They're too young to guide and they're too young for friendship. They need that. They need those boundaries. They need that black and white. They need us to be the grownups. I'd say the biggest expectation that is way too high that I definitely see in my clients and in just in the world and in the community, is that everyone else is somehow doing this well. Yeah. And that you didn't get the memo, that you suck, that, you know, everybody, you have a friend who has it all together. You guys, nobody has it all together. And if they do, I don't know, they're living a very inauthentic life because there's just no mom who has it all together. (laughs) Toddlers suck. Yeah, this age just sucks. It really does. The rapid development and the brains and the bodies, all the emotions, the physicality, this explosion of growth, right? It just sucks. And there seems to be this collective vibe that we need to fix the suckage right now. Like every aspect of sucking needs to be fixed, that any amount of suckage is bad. But there's a reality here that part of parenting just sucks. It's hard. Every age has something that's super hard. Yeah. Like my kid, yeah, he can stay home alone. He can go off with his friends all day long. He cooks his own food. He does his own laundry, right? That sounds like a dream, I'm sure, for you guys right now, right? That that I, I as a parent, have this like physical freedom that I didn't have years ago. However, I also have sex looming, drugs and drinking, peer pressure to think about. And 
I can't control the fact that he is going to make some really bad decisions. I want to control it, but I can't. Yeah, because he's growing up. Epic decisions, epic bad decisions have to happen. So yeah, so that's where my life sucks right now. I have a physical freedom that you guys don't have, but I also have this like mental, whoa, it's all changing, right? So don't be under the impression, don't have this expectation that the whole world is doing it well and you're not. Yeah, everybody's having a hard time. Oh, another expectation that's super big. And I see this like currently, it's all my clients. If you are dealing with crappy behavior and all of a sudden, you know, one of the biggest things that I'm working with in my coaching circle and my private clients is it's boundaries. It comes down to weak boundaries and boundaries that have like sort of flopped, flip flopped in the past. So we set the boundaries and then I have parents freaking out hours later that the boundary's not sticking, that the the child held was able to hold and accept the boundary for half the day. But then, you know, there was a meltdown, there was a tantrum, there was all this crappy behavior in the evening. Guys, because you set a boundary doesn't mean your child's going to be cool with it. In fact, it's their job to not be cool with it. It's their job. It's a boundary. It's a fence. What good is a fence if you don't test it? So the idea that once you say something, that once you start laying down these boundaries, your kid will be cool with it, that's crazy, yeah? Remember, your child's three, two, three, four, right? They're not going to just accept your answers. That's not the way growth happens, yeah? We hold the boundaries so they can learn. So if that's one of your struggles right now and you're learning how to hold boundaries and you're like, okay, I'm going to really like firm up the house and this is, you know, I'm going to be the grown up and I'm going to, I'm going to say how this day goes. We hold it so that the child can learn. They're going to kick against it today. They're going to kick against it tomorrow. They're going to keep kicking against it till at some point they go, oh, okay, mom means business. She means what she says. Dad means business. He means what he says. And then that's where you get the better behavior, right? better behavior, not perfect behavior. Please, please, please. In my book, in my podcast, I constantly use the word mitigate the crappy behavior. Mitigate, to lessen, to make smaller. We cannot eradicate all the crappy behavior. We cannot eradicate all the hard suckage of this age. You know, like I said, unless you want to go all violent and weird authoritarian, which I don't. Yeah. If we're being respectful in our parenting, we are helping our kids learn, learn their bodies, learn their emotions. And that shit is not fixed in an hour, in a day, in a week. I've said this before. I say it constantly on my Facebook lives that parenting is an ongoing practice. Yeah, it's a practice. The learning curve is steep, man. I can't even believe like if you think about the day you you had your baby to like three months when your baby's three months old, you're like, shit, I learned so much, right? Like we're constantly it's like a really steep learning curve. But somehow, you know, and I, I always talk about this, that the, the kid has been on the planet for only two or three years. You've only been a parent for two or three years. It's still an ongoing practice. And even with my kid being a teenager, I still think it's a practice, which incidentally, this is probably why it's so great being a grandparent, right? Because you practiced for so long that now you've got it. (laughs) But I think of this as like if you've ever been to a yoga class or any sort of any sort of workout class, really, right? Like you go and you learn and you start to you pick it up and It's like if you go to yoga class and you're trying to do balancing poses, you know, one day tree pose, you can't even hold it for anything. You keep wobbling out of it. You keep falling. Other days you're like, well, I don't know what the hell is happening, but I can hold tree pose forever, right? Same thing with parenting. It's a practice. Some days we're going to be good at it. Some days we're going to be bad at it, but we keep showing up and we keep showing up and giving it our best. Yeah. And It's never perfect. There's never a final destination. Like that's an expectation, right? Oh, as soon as I'm done potty training, parenting's going to be easy. As soon as this happens, parenting's going to be easy. As soon as this happens, parenting is going to be easy. It is never going to be easy. Yeah. So (laughs) just kind of keep that in mind. We have a collective high expectation that behavior 
is going to turn on a dime. So typically I get parents booking with me for like super, you know, quote unquote, bad behavior, crappy boundaries, whatever it may be. And they really do have this expectation that one hour, one hour or a week's worth of work and their kids will be fine, that all of this stuff is going to be fine. This idea that we can change a habit, any sort of habit in hours or a day or even a week. And so that's a huge thing, right? Is that like I always say diaper wearing, that's a habit. So if you change the habit when your child's two, it's a little bit easier than if you're trying to change the habit when your child's four, when they've literally doubled the lifespan of the habit. And so that is a very interesting thing. And I'll get into some potty training expectations too. I already mentioned that we have this collective expectation that potty training should take three days, three days flat. And if it takes longer than three days, well, clearly your child's not ready. And that is some kind of bullshit. Monarch Legacy of Monsters, an Apple original series. The world is on fire. I decided to do something about it. On November 17th. This place, it's not ours. Believe me. The most massive event of the year arrives. But if you come with me, you'll know everything, I promise. Oh my God, go, go, go! Monarch Legacy of Monsters, streaming November 17th, only on Apple TV+. Plus. One of the things, it's actually part of my, you know, how I became the, the potty training expert. It's part of that story. And I don't talk about it very much, but very early on, I don't know if you know my whole potty training story, but I was teaching classes, right? And there was this mom in the neighborhood. It was, you know, I taught local classes at a store I owned. And there was this mom in the a lovely woman. She was a therapist. And uh, us therapists and social workers, we're the trickiest because we <laughs> we're so good with other people's kids, but not necessarily with our own. And she was like, oh, my child's not ready. I'm not going to push him. And then, you know, he was three. Then a year later, he was four. And then he was four and a half. And he was going to be prevented from going to school because he needed to potty train. And this therapist who didn't want to push or attend or didn't think he was ready at the ages where he was most certainly ready ended up in this like crazy epic battle, like had to lock them both out of the house and had to keep him. It was this crazy showdown, had to keep him out of the house, occupied, running circles just to get this kid potty trained. And it was a nightmare. And the kid resisted and there were epic battles. She ended up having to like lock him in his room and they ended up in family therapy. And I was like, dude, you skewed the expectation by a lot. I was like, okay. And then subsequently, that is why I ended up, it's a huge reason why I ended up becoming a potty trainer. I was like, don't do that. Don't do that. I'm not going to do the thing I need to do now. I'll do it later because then it becomes this epic thing. And what happens is I see this expectation all the time in potty training. I'm not going to rush. I'm not going to push. I'm not going to rush. I'm not going to push, which I understand comes from a, a, a really kind hearted place. But then what happens is some sort of outside external thing like school demands potty training. And all of a sudden there's this expectation that your kid's going to do it and can do it in three days flat. And I always give this warning about potty training midsummer is like, if you have to potty train for preschool, please do not wait until the last week of August because the pressure you put on your child is the expectation that your child can suddenly do this in, in two or three days puts way too much pressure and it makes your child rebel. So that is a huge expectation in potty training that is way, way, way too high. We also have a lot of uh, expectations in night training. I'll often hear from parents that they will expect their two or two and a half year old to get out of bed in the dark and go to the bathroom, the, the big toilet, use the big toilet, put the lights on and, and go to the bathroom all by themselves. And so there's all kinds of high expectations in potty training. I get a lot of parents also who expect their child, again, to use the bathroom all by themselves, to get up on a step stool, lower their pants, you know, use the big toilet. So many parents resist the little potty chair. They think it's gross. And so they have this like expectation that a, a shorty, little toddler can do this all on their own. And so I think that's where a lot of expectations get way out of whack for being too high. Now, we also have expectations that are too low. And this is what's sort of crazy making, right? Is that we have 
we expect like logic. We expect these kids to be so compliant. And yet we also underestimate them at every single turn. Now, you know, if you've read my book or listened to this podcast at all, of course, one of the places we underestimate is children taking safe risks. Yeah, their risk assessment and letting our kids be and that our kids are way more capable than we think. And I think there's no other place to really say where our expectations are too low, except in real life. And that comes out in doing chores, doing things for themselves and helping you with real life. Real life, you guys, is purposeful work. Yeah. When we are doing real things, it makes it just more purposeful, it makes it feel better. And I'm trying to think of like as an adult, right? Like we can go run on, you know, a treadmill, but if you're like running from a lion (laughs) that's going to eat you, it's definitely more purposeful, right? Or like when I say like maybe we exercise, but we're doing training so that we can like, I don't know, move our house really effortlessly, you know, move boxes and be able to get up and downstairs and play with our kids and do that kind of thing. Right. And so it brings this purpose, this real life action. And so we can have these sort of fake, um, these fake go through the motions, or we can actually do this work. And as a side note, it's really funny. I went and saw um, an, an educational powwow for the Pequot Indians, which is a local Indian tribe here in Rhode Island. And it was so interesting. So the girls, the um, young women do this blanket dance and they have this blanket with like their, their family's um, sort of writings and decorations on it. And it was a suitor dance. So the young women play with this blanket and they move around a circle. And at the end, they would drop the blanket in front of the man that they would like to be their suitor, which I think that's really cool to, you know, choose, choose your suitor anyway. But, um, but one of the things that was really interesting is the dance was kind of dry. It was like the women had obviously learned the steps because it is just a dance competition at this point in time. The tribe is not like, you know, active in ancient times. Like it was, this isn't how they choose suitors in modern times. And it was such an interesting thing. Cause I thought, I thought, oh my God, if they were really choosing their suitor, it would be such a flirtatious dance, like the way they would use their blankets would be so much more interesting. And it just, it looked like they had learned dance steps. And so I bring that up because I feel like sometimes that's what we do with our kids. Like we invent these steps that are just perfunctionary and we don't, it it doesn't have this real life meaning. And when our kids actually help with real life, it has a drive behind it. It has an energy behind it and it has purpose behind it. And they feel good. It activates their pride. And remember, if you've read my book, I have that whole chapter about activating pride and how our kids want to be part of us. They want to be part of our tribe, of our family, and they don't want to do things when they feel loved. And part of it, they want to stay there. They don't want to do these things that get them kicked out, right? And so we want to activate that self-pride. We want to activate that. I help. I'm part of this house. I'm part of this family. And that is, we just have... So low expectations. Yeah. Let's just run through a quick um, list of what you can expect your two, three, four year old to be doing. I always say like kind of jokingly, of course, that like the minute they're born, we want to start thinking of like, how can we make them more independent? You know, it's like how if you approach your parenting, like how can I make them more independent? How can I get them out of my house? (laughs) And of course, we're not going to kick our kids out before their time. But I think it's a really good gauge in our head and our hearts of like how to push forward because we're all guilty of doing too much for our kids. And it's just the culture. I do it too. Like I, especially since I'm single and it's just me and Pascal, like oftentimes I will just do for him without even thinking because I'm more effective because I'm faster. So it, I have to push my own, uh, my own mindset and, and make him do more and more. But for your younger kids, you definitely, you know, getting dressed alone. They can definitely help with laundry, um, folding, particularly like towels and washcloths and maybe t-shirts or pants. You know, we're, we're not going to, we don't want them actually getting frustrated. They can match socks. That's a great thing to do. They can help with cleaning. They can help with dusting. They love a feather duster. That can be an awesome chore. Vacuuming. They love to vacuum. Again, none of these are we're expecting like a flawless job, of course, but just activating that pride and getting your child involved. Sweeping, uh, particularly with the little dustpan and brush. 
your two, three, four-year-old really can make basic sandwiches. Maybe not things like peanut butter and jelly where the peanut butter is going to like wreck the bread and they'll get super frustrated. But definitely if you're going to do like ham and cheese, your child can absolutely slap ham and cheese on two pieces of bread. Yeah. Any help in the kitchen, if you can, you know, whenever you're in the kitchen and it doesn't always have to be time consuming, making dinner like this, um, you know, I know how time consuming it is when you have your toddler help you make dinner, but it can be, you know, like, oh, honey, could you get me this or could you help me in the kitchen? And, and they could be your little errand runner to the fridge, whatever. They love doing that. Um, your average toddler can care for pets, get the food, make sure the water's there. Yeah, they may not be able, of course, to walk the pets unless you have teeny tiny pets, <laughs> but they can definitely help with the food. Outside, they can wash toys. You guys want to buy yourself a nice afternoon, get a bucket of soapy water and have your child wash their outside toys. Busy for hours. They can help rake leaves, pick up sticks. Inside, they can make their bed. This is perfect if you have like a duvet cover um, that can just be kind of pulled over the bed. Or you can really, you know, work with them on how to make a bed with hospital corners if that's your thing, if you have the, the full bed set up. But definitely uh, show them how to make their bed. That That's proven to like set up people for the best day. They could be in charge of water bottles. Yeah. Before you leave for the park, make sure they fill the water bottles, have a step stool near the sink. They can they can do that. They can absolutely set the table, clear the table. They can help wash dishes, um, particularly if you have like Tupperware or plastics, anything like that. Um, glasses that won't break. I have I have always used mason jars, like the little mason jars for glasses, because they seem to be able to take a beating. They can be dropped and they don't break very easily. And then absolutely make sure your child's cleaning up their own mess. Again, that's one thing that I think we're all super guilty of is, you know, the child just walks away and we clean up the mess, mostly because we're just kind of moving about the house anyway. And so it's no skin off our teeth, but it becomes a very bad habit. Yeah. A place that I see in parenting where the expectation is really too low is that your child can't handle any real talk. And of course, the last few episodes of this podcast, we had real talk about genitals and sex and consent and all these weird and yucky things that the hard stuff, right? But a lot of times we underestimate what our kids can handle when it's big things like moving, divorce, or like if your family's experiencing financial problems, we have this expectation that number one, that our kids aren't even noticing it, which is wrong. You guys, if there's a pink elephant in your house, I can assure you that your child has noticed it. If nothing else, they're noticing your stress about it. So it's always wise in very simple terms to let your child know what's happening. I worked with a, a client, uh, I don't know, last year, and they were moving and they hadn't told the child and they had kept her room exactly as it was. And then the rest of the house was being packed up. And God love this mom. She was a beautiful, wonderful mom. But just on this particular area, she was like, oh, she doesn't know we're moving. We've kept her room the same. Everything else is boxed up. And I was like, you guys, of course she knows something's happening. Like <laughs> the whole house is in boxes except her room. Like that's very bizarre. You know, does she think you're, does she think you're leaving her? Because, you know, kids can think weird things. They, it can go in sideways if we don't actually say the words. So we worked on that. A huge thing people overestimate is when they're pregnant, right? And that child one is starting to stress out about the baby. And I'm like, no, that's not really happening. Like the child might be stressed because you're talking about it too much, but they, your toddler, if you're pregnant with your second, your toddler really, really, really does not understand that you're growing a human in there. They have no idea the ramifications of what's going to happen when that baby enters their life, right? So that's an overestimation. And then there's this underestimation about these harder issues. And so it's very easy to talk in kids terms. You know, mommy and daddy are having a really hard time right now. Daddy's going to just go stay at his own place for a little while. Easy way to talk about divorce, right? Or you know what, mommy and daddy, you know, like we have so much love right now, but we're just, we're running low on money. And so we have these, you know, we're going to do some of these free things or we're not buying things right now. You can easily say things just point blank, not emotionally loaded 
and it lets your child in and it releases your gauge a little so that you're not like trying to hide and dance around your child. Because when you are doing that, it's that that culture of secrecy and your child's going to pick up on it. They're going to be like, what's going on? And they're never going to be able to articulate it. Instead, it's going to show up in crappy behavior. And lastly, I think one of the biggest things that we underestimate, our expectation is way too low, is that any hardship, any discomfort on our kids. We've we've become a world where discomfort is is not acceptable, right? And any little whimper needs to be attended to. And every little cry or we just don't want any hardship for our kids. And of course, it's based in like we want our kids to not have hardship, right? Hardship can suck. But you guys, that no growth is there. And that is how you raise an entitled child. That is how... It happens that kids become crazy, entitled brats later on, right? Because they've experienced no hardship. It is okay for your child to be uncomfortable in certain situations. I think a classic one is is thirst. And I think I've mentioned this on, on this show before, maybe not, but it was a pivotal moment. You know, when Pascal was little, sippy cups were just kind of, they had hit their stride, right? The idea that you could have this cup that didn't spill water all over the place. And it was kind of awesome. And um, my friend, I had this friend, Jamie, who was awesome. And she refused to do sippy cups. She was like, they're too old to be sucking on something. They need real glasses. And I was like, but how do you handle, how do you handle like in the car? And she was like, they can wait. They can wait till they get home and have a glass of water. Like nobody's that thirsty. And I thought, oh my God, she's so right. And so we, it's okay to like delay this gratification a little bit. It's not only okay. They, I mean, study after study after study proves that that delayed gratification is the key to a well-lived life, right? Because if we're all, I need it right now, we're miserable. So I think that's just worth, you know, playing with. And I'm not suggesting that you dehydrate your child, but we also, I know from potty training that we also overhydrate our kids. Like we don't have to be pushing water all day, all the time. And uh, I think it's okay with hunger too. Nobody wants a hangry toddler. So I always think, you know, there should be emergency food for sure in the car or in your purse for for hangry and when the child's having a meltdown because of uh, a food, a need for food. But on the other hand, I do think it's okay to delay hunger. Like we don't have to be snacking all day long. And that's a huge, huge issue. I see it time and time again, like, oh, I have the pickiest eater. I have the pickiest eater. And then it turns out you go to, you know, three meals, no snacking. And all of a sudden the kid is not a picky eater and eating like gangbusters at meals. So I think that's another place where it's okay for your child to be a little uncomfortable. And that's a place where I think we collectively have some very low expectations. All right. I am going to log off for today. I hope that was helpful in realizing that You know, and I I by no means have I hit every single high expectation or low expectation, but I hope I've changed your perspective a little in that what we can really, really expect from our little ones. And to remember that my big pull, of course, is is less formal activities, less formal academics and way more life skills. And that 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 really is my whole my whole shtick. Right. (laughs) And don't shame your child. These things are um, the way our kids grow. And so I hope this has shifted your perception just a little bit about what they are capable of and also what they're not capable of. Yeah. And what their brain development, where it really is. All right, you guys, as always, rock on. All right, I'm going to sign off for today. You can always go to jamieglowacki.com for the super cool latest updates, including the launch of my new book, yummy new book pre-sale treats, when we release new episodes, and how to work with me directly. And of course, if you need any potty training help, there's a handy link there that will take you to all my potty training resources, including all my courses. That's the Oh Crap Potty Training online course, my pooping solutions course, and my night training supplement. And if you need additional help, how to book with a certified OCRAP consultant. That's all at jamieglowacki.com. Have a beautiful day and rock on.